Hi, everyone. I am so excited to welcome you to today's episode with the incredible Dr. Sarah Salvador. We have been friends. We've worked on some projects together. We worked together on the set of Reverse. We're having so much time with our preamble, just kind of talking back and forth that I definitely was wanting to touch on a few things again and bring them up so that you all can benefit from them. But welcome, Sarah. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, give us a little bit of your your backstory, your certification. I think most of my audience actually knows you very well and follows you. But for those of you that that don't yet, um, uh, let us let us know a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Emily. I was so happy that I met you in person in Costa Rica filming reverse TV series, which I think is going to be out in July from what I've uh, what I've uh, gotten from Charles, our director. So really soon you you guys were are going to be able to see the first ever mainstream TV show on the carnivore diet. Very excited about that. So we actually also, you and I stayed in the same place in Costa Rica, in the same house, right? I want to talk about this. This was so sweet. You guys, our carnivore leaders have such generous servant hearts. And one of the things that was really striking to me on uh, the reverse experience was um, that we kept on getting in at all these weird times in the night. Our planes kept on getting mixed up. And here was Dr. Kiltz, okay? He is like fertility specialist, like been professional, like been doing all these things. And so he chose to put his little bed in the cot in the living room behind the couch. There was a little bed that he slept on. And every time somebody came in, he popped up and welcomed them and showed them around, showed us to our room. And the, the um, room, the Airbnb that we had was so beautiful. Um, and you had gotten there a couple of days before we were kind of, you know, ships in the night passing. We only had about a day that we were overlapping and it was really fun just to know that. So then, you know, you got to be there and you had to go back to do your stuff. And then uh, Dr. Kiltz moved me into the suite he didn't he didn't take it himself he's like oh yeah no, have that and so we got this gorgeous um king bed with like deluxe shower and these doors that open up to like a hammock and a porch with views everywhere and it was really fun just be like oh we were almost roommates kind of roommates and uh yeah that that was incredible and what I want to say about my observations of you in that space was that I have um, obviously known how beautiful, gorgeous, healthy, carnivore strong. I've known these things about you as facts. Um, to see you in action as an educator I was incredible. And it was just like, she has it all. She's got the brains, she's got the smarts, and she has the connection. Um, so tell us a little bit about like your, your education. You are a doctor in some things. Tell us about that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I did my education in Lebanon. I grew up in Lebanon and I did my bachelor's and my master's degree in nutrition and dietetics. And I did my, uh, I got my license dietetics uh, in dietetics as well over there. So I did my whole um, hospital internship for a year. And then you study extensively for a, kind of like a board exam to become a licensed dietitian. And then after that came to uh, Miami um, to, and I got my PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition from the University of Miami. And uh, throughout that period of time, I was obviously, you know, teaching nutrition courses at the University of Miami, DeVry University, Miami Dade College. Also, we taught for the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, which is the hardest um, personal trainer exam to pass, a so 60% pass rate from the first try. And so this is why they hired me to train want to be personal trainers to sit for that exam and pass it better like with the from the from the get-go so i would hold those intense workshops on the weekends friday saturday sunday three day full day things and i did that for a long time as well until the pandemic hit which is when they started doing everything online so uh yeah i taught nutrition courses and actually a lot of exercise physiology courses as well at the university of miami i also worked on research over there all kinds of research um at um what else so i've been in the academic world as a classically trained uh, di dietitian and also you know exercise physiologist for a long time while at the same time trying to figure out my battles with food addiction sugar addiction acne depression anxiety i mean you name it i've got it <laughs> 
<laughs> on your own, you were still kind of struggling with some of these life life issues as you were. Did you get into it because of your personal desire to solve those things for yourself? And did Absolutely. the training help you? Like, you know, how how did that go? Yeah, I uh, I wanted to be a journalist when I was 17, 18. At the same time, I was I was torn between journalism or um, nutrition and dietetics. And at the same time, I was also battling a lot with the weight gain and the food addiction. And I had gained a lot of weight um, in that, that last year of high school. And so in that last thing that, that pushed me to do nutrition was this idea that there are no dietitians that are overweight, right? Like in my head, I'm like, mm. if I get and I become a dietitian, then there's no way in hell that I would uh, still battle with my weight. And so obviously that was a very naive thing <laughs> that, but, um, because that my, one of my professors who I love to this day, um, you know, she, she was very overweight, you know? And, and so that was the first time I realized that you can have all this knowledge and she is very knowledgeable, but yet still not be able to lose the weight. And that's because I still did not understand addiction back then, right? And I didn't realize that just learning what foods to eat means nothing if you're battling an addiction and you you don't even realize it's an addiction, you know? So yeah, that's why I got into it. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. That's, yeah, yeah. that's why I got into it. And then eventually uh, at the same time, okay, the, the reason why I learned about carnivore is because I was also having a lot of acne. And so I went to dermatologist after another, and they put me on everything, took everything, spironolactone for two years, Accutane twice, antibiotics for months on end, three months, thankfully it wasn't more than that, but I'm sure that that did a lot of damage already. Um, birth control pills. That, I even took the birth control pills when I came to Miami uh, that first semester um, my diet wasn't that great. I, at that point, when I came to Miami, I had already discovered that the paleo diet healed my skin when all the other drugs didn't. Um, but I was still, my compliance wasn't that great because I was so overwhelmed. You know, I was in a new country all by myself. I didn't have anybody. I didn't even have a car. <laughs> so um, I saw the dermatologist at UM and uh, they put me on birth control. Obviously, again, that didn't work. So um, that's how I first started seeing the breaks in, uh, the mainstream medicine model. And, you know, that not, not everything that a, a doctor tells you is, is true because obviously nothing works. And, um, that's when I started doing paleo and I realized when I did paleo for a full month straight, my skin cleared up. Mm. And then, and then eventually I uh, got into keto because I, I didn't have a lot of public speaking experience. And all of a sudden I come to Miami, they throw me in and I could go lecture to hundreds of people. I'd have like auditoriums filled with students. And I'm like, I'm not that much older than these kids. You know, some of them were like very close to my age and I, you know, so I had very little experience and that gave me a lot of anxiety. It was overwhelming. I did good. Like, I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, you know how sometimes you can be very, very anxious, but like people don't even realize it because you can hide it so well. Oh, but I know. Me, That's right. right? Uh, but, it, but it shouldn't be like that. You should be having fun, you know, like when you teach now, it's like, I look forward to teaching, you know, I, I actually enjoy it. Um, so that's how it was. And that's what pushed me to look into, uh, a diet for anxiety, which is where I discovered Dr. Pearl Mutter's content on his website about high fat, you know, keto diets for brain health and anxiety. And I started doing that, not even realizing that it's going to help me drop body fat easier. So that's how I got into it. And then from there, the sugar addiction, food addiction is still there. So I would watch Joe Rogan. I was like, oh, give me anything new to do because I'm still struggling. And that's how I came about across Does Joe Rogan get into that? The Sean Baker's, uh, Paul Saladino, um, Michaela, and her dad's, um, you know, the Peterson interviews, all this stuff. I started watching all this stuff. It's so funny. Like I'd be, so I'd be doing really great, you know, dropping weight, et cetera. And then any, any kind of external stressor would push me into a binge cycle mm -hmm. and I would be so sad about it. And, you know, I'd be, I'd be having the, the, the junk food while at the same time watching a Joe Rogan podcast, mm -hmm. you know, well, while you're trying to listen to the answer. Yeah. 
And, and then he kind of have these guests that were really focused on that food addiction component of it while you were in your food addiction. Exactly. Exactly. It kind of made, made me feel maybe a little less guilty about what I was eating. If I felt like at least I'm learning something out of that experience, you know, um, I guess that's why I did it. And then eventually you listen to those enough times, you start realizing that you maybe we don't need vegetables. And then another experience with my hubby, he had really bad low back pain mm -hmm. to the point where he, ne he needed to get surgery, which is something we were trying to really postpone because it's got risks involved until, and then as I'm listening to all this content, Dr. Stephen Gundry's The Plant, Plant Paradox, where I read all the book and yeah. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe the only, only vegetable he ever ate was a bed of spinach. He didn't even have um, salad dressings on it or anything. He would just <laughs> get some spinach leaves and then put a chicken on top or ground turkey or whatever. I was like, you know what? Maybe you should cut out the spinach and let's just try and see before you get that surgery. Guess what happened? I mean, it's, it's mind blowing to this day. It, I mean, this is now like around 10 years later, instead of the low back pain getting worse after a decade, he has none, oh. you know? surgery oh no no oh. no no canceled the surgery and no more back pain he used to not be able to sleep enough hours because you stay on his if he stayed on his back for a long longer than i don't know six or seven hours it really start hurting he couldn't ever sleep in um he couldn't go on road trips like if we wanted to drive let's say six seven hours to visit our in-laws or whatever he couldn't do that um he couldn't watch two movies in a row if you just want to you know, if it's raining outside, you want to have this cozy little, you know, lazy day and just watch movies. He couldn't do that. Just a couple time, just normal couple time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now he can do all this and more. Like, it doesn't matter. He can be sitting or sleeping for hours on end. It just, it's gone. It's completely gone. It's, I, I still can't believe it. So, you know, that, that also, once you see those kinds of things, you're like, okay, I'm not going to eat vegetables. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that I need. Um, you know, and it's not something that's addictive, that's hard to stay away from either. So it was a very easy way to drop it from your diet, you know? Um, so yeah, that was the progression. A lot of, sorry, I talk a lot. <laughs> tell me, no, tell me. I love thing. hearing the stories about it and hearing the story about your husband too. And so um, this, the back pain is such a huge issue. You know, everybody's so scared of injuring their back because once you injure it, it's so hard to get it, get back on track. And um, I think that you know, there, there's all these other implications from the diet and the lifestyle that once you get into trouble with back pain, it's, it's such a, a tough situation to move out of. Um, what mechanistically, when you think about your husband's body and what happened with him and how all he had to do was keep, get the spinach out. And you knew that from, you know, all of these different processes of learning. So what was happening in his body that took that pain away? So I did the research to figure out what was it in the spinach that could have caused it. The first thing that comes to your mind is like, oh, it's got to be the oxalate. Mm -hmm. But the, he, we had another experience that pushed me to, to realize it wasn't the oxalate. Um, he, we went to North Carolina, which is where his mom and sister and his family is. So we went there for, I think it was Thanksgiving. Um, and his mom makes the most delicious corn pudding. It's like a tradition. So he had some of that and the low back pain after it had been gone for a long time, years, or maybe one year, um, he had some of that. And like in an instant, the low back pain came back with a vengeance for three days straight. I think it was three days or like for a few days. Um, and I'm like, what, what, how, can, how can that be? I thought we were done with that. And I realized, wait a second, what was the only plant food you had? And it was that it was the uh, <laughs> the corn. And so I did my research. What is something that is commonly found in both? Turns out it's called aquaporins, A-Q-U-A-P-O-R-I-N-S. I used to, you know, I almost won the spelling bee contest in when I was like seven, when I was like 10 or 11 <laughs> with um, amongst like uh, the three grades. It was like my age group and then uh, uh, two older age groups also. So it was a big deal. And then I lost because of the word dessert. Um, and I spelled it as desert instead of dessert. And then I started- Oh, that was such an easy one. That was <gasps> such an easy I started crying. It was like, it was so And you fun. could spell plant chemicals like a champ. Oh my God. You would think, yeah, I know that you would think like, this is the easiest thing. And I lost for that. Otherwise I would have been the, the, the champion, but it's okay. <laughs> Anyway, so aquaporins, um, 
turns out to be commonly found in spinach, soy, tomatoes, and corn. So yeah, that's how we figured it out. I did a whole YouTube video on it. So I think mm -hmm. if you Google aquaporin, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar or spinach, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, it'll show up it's like a full 10 minute video. And I show you a, a really beautiful study paper written on it, like a review paper with all of the graphics and the physiology and i link it and i show you parts of it and i show you what you gotta understand how how consuming aquaporins can lead to um, nerve damage and all of those symptoms that my hubby had oh my goodness and this took him from in pain not able to do basic normal things to fully functional life and in just a moment like that it got him right back at that yeah um, he can bend over without pain anymore he used to really struggle to be able to bend over and now it's like wow i mean just it's, it's still to this day sometimes we'll remember like wow this is amazing do you and your husband ever dabble in you know if some people will look at carnivore as an elimination diet and then they'll try mm -hmm. to add foods back is that something that the two of you have experimented with how's that gone for you I don't look at the carnivore diet as an elimination diet, you know, just like a lion doesn't look at their all meat diet as an elimination diet, right? Right. I look at it as our species specific diet. This is the one food we ate. That's all we ate for millions of years when we evolved during an ice age, right? Where plants yes. couldn't grow because it was an ice age, right? So, um, so my hubby doesn't do carnivore like strictly he do he does animal based so he'll still have a little bit of olives and a little bit like but small amounts of broccoli that's like super steamed and he'll mix it all with the ground turkey and the ground beef and he'll he'll prep it for days on end and it's just literally all he'll eat is this tons of meat with tiny amounts of black olives and tiny amounts of broccoli added in just for flavor and he'll have every morning um only if he's hungry sometimes he'll skip it but he'll have just literally just pure eggs either boiled eggs or scrambled eggs like nine eggs and that's it yeah so he doesn't and he does have cheats so for he's never had like a food addiction sugar addiction right he's you know? he, he and normie i've been in i've been in your groups dr zavadar and i've learned so much uh if you guys have not checked out what Sarah's offering these, these days, she's offering actually group support as well, which you, you're getting right now, how knowledgeable she is, how, if there's anything you are curious about, about any of this, you can bring it and she will explain it to you fully. So just, I'm um, so excited that I had an opportunity to do that. Yeah, really good. Um, and so I think that I was curious, you said that sometimes olives, I actually am curious. That's one that I will see people bring back a lot is olives pickles and cucumbers. Can you give me a little information on those three and why that might not be the best idea other than the fact that we weren't designed to eat it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think people look at that as a very low sugar plant food. So it's not going to affect your blood sugar in, uh, at all. And I think also that since they're not beans and they're, they're not grains, so they don't have very high amounts of anti-nutrients like lectins. And so they, people just assume they are completely harmless. And I mean, for some people, if you genetically have uh, a good resistance to anti-nutrients, they might not do much damage. However, as we age, our defenses, our natural defenses against those plant anti-nutrients, because you still have them, you still have some in all of those plant foods, your natural defense. Every plant food, every plant there is, is going to have some kind of an anti-nutrient. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I remember when I was doing keto, um, years ago, and I would check my ketones, I remember very clearly that there was a time where I was so amazingly perfect with adherence to the ketogenic diet, and my ketones weren't high. I was like, how can that be? This makes zero sense. And I realized the only difference was that I introduced zucchini to make zucchini pasta. Mm, oh, I did that. That little, yeah, that crank thing, the, the zoodles. The zoodles. <laughs> Right. Because of the seeds and whatever, whatever the zucchini had, it was stressing me out internally and the cortisol pushes you out of the fat burning stage. That's right. Isn't that amazing that, and I was like, wow, it's just because of the zucchini that I just cannot enter ketosis. Yes. 
Yes. So what I hear you saying is some people like your husband, that's kind of on the normie side of things. I had never actually heard that word. So I want you to define that for us in just a sec from the addiction standpoint, but that there might not be um, physical, like their back might not hurt from these ingredients that were in the corn that you guys figured out, but there could be some other things. And so you're just kind of saying that, that um, from the food addiction standpoint, he doesn't have that part of it. And so what's different between somebody that ends up in a food addiction, sugar addiction, and, and, and a normie? <laughs> yeah, great question. And this is something that we talk a lot about in the addiction world, especially food addiction. You have three types of people. You have the normies who can have a little bit of sugar and just stop. Like the next day they go back to eating their normal diet. No problem. They're not losing sleep over that. They're not going into an existential crisis <laughs> in order to not touch the on that scale. Doesn't he sound like that? He might be on that scale. Cause I've heard him say kind of time to time, you know? Yeah. He's definitely, he's definitely a normie, maybe a little bit, a little bit, you know, it, it's not like he doesn't care about the sugar. He he waits for them every week, but he can very easily, like he'll have his cheat one day a week or sometimes every 10 days he'll have it. Yep. And then next day, no problem. Just go back to eating eggs and his beef and jerky, whatever meals, prep meals that are always the same, you know? So that's, that's around 30% of people. They are normies. And another 30 or 33% or another third of the population is what we call harmful user, whereby those are people who they've developed some level of addiction to addictive foods, but they can use some level of discipline to regulate how much they consume. You know, so my hubby could be like in the edge between a normie and a harmful user because mm -hmm. he's not the kind of person who can have just one bite of cake and leave it. He's like, he, he's like, if I have a bite, I want the whole cake, mm -hmm. you know, if I, you know, so I think he may be like, towards maybe a harmful user, but like very easy for him to use the, I shouldn't say easy, he'll kill me. He uses a lot of discipline. It's not easy for him. He's a very disciplined person. And I, you know, we had someone like this when I, the month that I was in your challenge that was, had used that discipline so much to just, you know, keep herself in this zone. And um, it was really amazing to watch you help her identify which one she was and using those tools. And so I definitely want to hear about the other third of the population, which it seems like a lot of us that um, are drawn to the 100% carnivore diet, because this is our ancestral diet, let's not forget this, but we are motivated because of what third of this population we are actually in. And mm. we really are the, this is the only way that we can find food freedom, that we can realize our ideal size, even if you know that's still, we got to manage that. I, I still have to manage that. I don't know if you do. It's not natural for me to stay at the size that I want. I have to kind of work for it. Um, but yeah, so tell me yeah. about that third category and how you can tell if you might be that third category. Cause I watched you do it in action in your coaching session. I just was standing in awe, like drop the microphone. Like she just helped this person understand where she was in that scale. Thank you so much. Yeah, there, there are very clear criteria that we use and the, the um, psychiatry associations use, um, and it's, they publish those 11 criteria for food addiction. Well, for addiction, they still don't add food addiction in there. And those 11 criteria for addiction are very clear. And you can take those tests and know exactly where you, how you rank on it. So we were talking about a third of the population are normies. Another third are harmful users. And another third are addicts. That means those are people who they have repeated. <laughs> yes, me too. Right. <laughs> they have repeated this act of engaging in highly palatable addictive foods for so long that um, the pathways in their brain now have been hijacked to the point where you have increased attentional bias to anything that's addictive. Like if I'm watching a TV show and there's, if I'm watching Seinfeld, let's say, I, this, they're, they're having the whole scene play out and I'm looking at the serial behind Seinfeld. Like, yes. Oh, that's intentional advice. I actually did my dissertation. Actually, my doctoral dissertation was on sugar addiction and exercise. Like that's, that was what I spent years of my life researching and doing a deep dive in. And that's my whole, uh, you know, last four years of the doctorate was all about addiction. So I, and I used one of the parameters that I measured in my subjects in my dissertation was I measured their attentional bias to 
food cues, you know, the more addiction you have in your brain, the faster you spot anything that's addictive, the faster you spot that piece of cake that's like in the background over there or, you know, so yeah, that's a third of the population. And um, it might come a little bit genetically, or it might come just from repeated exposure and ingestion of a highly, it might not be our fault. This might just be kind of a genetic predisposition that we have to be in this 30% Yes. Uh, it is never your fault. This was done to us. This was never our fault. Nobody, uh, w- when you're a baby, you're not choosing to ingest a drug that's far more addictive than heroin, right? Mm-hmm. This was done to you from the food industry, knowing full well that if they increase the sugar and fat combination in their foods, it's that combination that's even worse than sugar. And they market it to you and they, and they convince your parents that this is a health food you know, then they know that they have a, a, uh, a customer for life, right? <laughs> so this was, this was done to us as children when we had no defenses. We got exposed to a highly addictive drug that now predisposes us to struggle with not just food addiction, by the way, any other kind of an addiction. Because once you destroy the dopamine receptors in your brain, all bets are off. Whichever way you can get your dopamine hit, you're going to be vulnerable to get it from that area. It could be extensive shopping. It can be, um, if because let's say you go on a diet, right? And all of a sudden you can't hit the dopamine. You can get the dopamine hits from the food. So now you start shopping a little more or you start drinking or, or smoking or whatever. You know, it's called addiction interaction disorder. And so this is why with my work, it's always about not just getting people to stop the drug, which is the food or the sugar, but it's more important to heal the dopamine damage, this Mm -hmm. destruction in the dopamine receptors, we call them D2 receptors, and you can actually heal that and regenerate the D2 receptors. And there are a lot of things that you can do to do that. But the, I, in my opinion, the quickest, best, fastest, most effective way is obviously exercise. And the more intense the exercise, the more D2 receptor regeneration you're going to have, even at baseline, even when you wake up in the morning, now you just have higher levels of dopamine activity in your brain because you've raised the amount of D2 receptors in your brain. So exercise actually changes your brain chemistry from those of us that are in that 30% that we're kind of in that addict zone and we're doing carnivore. This is an interesting question because um, is sometimes when people start on carnivore, I tend as a coach to focus on the food first and to focus on getting their diet and their environment really cleaned up first. Like we really focus on their social environment, their relationships, their physical environment to try to make this a really supportive um, kind of environment for them. And then I hear what you're saying that they're still going to have for most of us or many of us or a third of us, we're going to have some level of addiction that we're still going to be having to actively manage. How soon, how quick do you incorporate that in? Like, for example, when you're in a one-on-one coaching client, like right from the get-go or, you know, how, how do you introduce that? Yeah. I, even before you cut out the sugar, I recommend mm. people start because then it's just so much easier to cut out the sugar, right? Because as you heal the dopamine receptors, even before the first day of cutting out the sugar, you won't have as strong of a withdrawals as if you hadn't started the healing process. So yeah, from the get-go, I definitely recommend that because this is fixing the root cause of the addiction. Now here's the, the obviously, what you've done has worked as well. And the reason it works is because abstinence also regenerates the D2 receptors, right? It just but here's t- the- takes longer than you don't get Exactly. That. Okay. Exactly. So it takes two years for the brain chemistry to return to normal. After. I'm a two-year carnivore. I'm a two and a half-year carnivore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, well, this is what we've known in like, and this is why in severe addictions, the recommendation, the gold standard is to put somebody away in a facility for two years, because this is the amount of time that it takes for brain chemistry to return to normal. And I have, I have to say, there's a little caveat there. It can take up to seven to 10 years if you want to get back to 100%. But the two year mark is significant because this is where you get, and that's my estimation is that you get around 90 to 95% healing, which is phenomenal, you know, compared to where you were, you know, you can now experience joy on a more regular basis from normal, natural dopamine producing activities like socialization, Mm -hmm. exercise, everything now makes you happier 
much more easily and for a longer period of time. So you yes. can go back to being happy all the time. And from little things here and there keeps you, keeps you high, keeps you motivated, keeps you happy. You don't have those dips anymore, you know? So you definitely abstinence first because I do have clients who cannot work out. They have severe joint pain, you know? So it's, it can't, it's not like, oh, it'll never work out for you. It's like, no, there are other things. And the reason also why it works so well, what you're doing is because of those mirror neurons and uh, and having that support, that support is so crucial. It gives you so much energy, psychological energy to prevent you from relapsing, you know? So there, there are definitely a lot of tools. And my recommendation is the more you layer those tools, the higher the chances of success, you know? Absolutely. You're, you're, you're getting a lot of tools in your toolbox as you're healing. Um, I love what you said about um, the, 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 your ketones. I want to go back to that a little bit and how you were saying that um, what caused a disruption in your ketones was um, sort of from the plants and from the things that were happening in there, but it also kind of had to do with mood, energy, relationship. And I've heard this concept before that even when people that are really focused on ketones, which I personally do not focus on that, but I, I you know, sometimes I do. And I think it can be an important feature of mental health for people um, that sometimes it's actually the other um, rocks in your life, the big rocks, the relationships um, that um, can actually affect your level of ketosis. Have you seen that? I haven't personally done research on that, but just you bringing up this idea, it makes perfect sense because we know that psychological stress also leads to increases in cortisol. And we know yes. every time cortisol spikes, it suppresses or it, it raises your blood glucose level and by raising your blood glucose level, that's going to suppress ketone elevation, right? And mm -hmm. so um, it would make total sense to me that if you are living in a very stressful environment, you're getting those spikes in cortisol, which means you're getting spikes in blood sugar level, and you're not going to have high levels of ketones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It all goes back to that. So I'm thinking about the, a lot of uh, people are watching this will have been in the, um, the, the keto kind of world. Um, and I was curious about a plant-based um supplement that we have a lot of folks in our groups use for that are supposed to help with blood sugar re regulation is supposed to help with digestion. And we just had somebody in group that was saying, this was the thing that was causing my glucose to skyrocket. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? <laughs> it would be apple cider vinegar. And so I don't know if you hear people using ACV, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting in our, in our carnivore space. We're like, it's carnivore, but you can add mustard if you want, which of course is true. It's carnivore, but you can use some ACV to, you know, somehow help your blood sugar if you want. And so I'm curious, have you seen that reaction before with ACV? And why do you think that could have caused that? Wow. That's interesting that it raised somebody's blood sugar. I, I mean, significantly. I mean, it was high, high, high. As soon as she cut that out, boom, back in the seventies and eighties. I wonder if that's a histamine reaction that led to the stress, right? That, yeah. right, that would be like the first thing that comes to my mind. I've generally constantly uh, cautioned against ACV, apple yeah. cider vinegar. I was wondering. Right? First of all, it's going to mess your animal. It's going to erode the animal on your teeth. You do your not want to have high sure. mm -hmm. um, And even if you tell me that you're going to use a straw so that your teeth don't get messed up. I know personally people who are a carnivores who've been doing that. Actually, it's Colt Milton. People know him. He's an oh, sure. yeah. We've said it in an interview sure. together. Yeah, he shared that it gave him an ulcer. Uh, just a, a few weeks only, a few months, maybe a couple months or so um, of ACV supplementation gave him an ulcer, landed him in the hospital. And actually, this is a well-known thing. Like, even if you just Google it, you'll see that it increased risk of ulcers, which makes sense. It's, it's a highly acidic uh, thing. And if sometimes people will do it to raise their HCL levels, their acid levels in their stomach to help them digest meat after not eating meat for a while. Because if you don't eat enough meat for a long period of time, your body realizes that maybe I don't need to spend and, you know, produce all this acid because we, we don't, we're not eating high protein foods that require this high acid. So maybe I need to downregulate that. Well, um, there's that. There's also another uh, thing whereby if you have inflammation in your stomach uh, or gastritis from eating carbs and inflammatory foods and seed oils and all the stuff we know we shouldn't be eating. So if you have a, some level of gastritis, some level of inflammation, your body knows that it needs to protect itself. So that's downregulate the HCL 
stomach acid production so that we don't irritate an already irritated gut lining and stomach lining, mm -hmm. right? And so if you go and you kind of force the stomach acid to go back up by taking HCL pills or taking HCV, it's like you're setting yourself up for an injury. The, the body is intentionally reducing its HCL production in order to protect itself because it knows its gut lining can't handle all this HCL, you know? So the best way to get your body to heal is again, slowly start increasing the amount of meat that you're eating. And if you feel a little bit of indigestion, just try to go with smaller meals spread out through throughout the day. And in just a span of a few weeks, the gastritis is going to calm down and your body will naturally be able to increase its HCL production as opposed to kind of force things, you know, to happen. So there is that. Um, and I know that there, I mean, the studies that show that HCV drops your blood sugar level by 30% and people get excited about that. But you know what else drops your blood sugar by 100%? <laughs> Not eating carbs, you know, like, oh. I, I, I don't see the reason for it. You know what I mean? Right, right. We've got the power tool. We've got the main show of how to manage our blood sugar regulation. And so why are we needing to add extra tricks? Because anytime you add a plant food or something that came out of that, then you're risking uh, causing a reaction in your body. And so, and I was also said that the mother potentially could have caused this histamine response, that there's a lot of things that could have gone in to do that. And yeah. The, the carnivore plan can be so simple. I am curious, are, are there some supplements that you tend to recommend over time? Or do you tend to find that in most instances, like what you're saying with the small meals, a gradual increase in protein, that you're going to get a, a natural response from your body to do the right thing? It depends. It really depends which client I'm working with, their history, what they're taking right now. Uh, let's, th let's start with organ meats, right? I'm not convinced that we need Oregon meats in general. However, if you come from a vegan background and you've just developed a gazillion marginal deficiency, you're barely hanging by a thread. I want to try and boost your nutrition as quickly as possible. And I don't like synthetic multivitamins. Most of them don't get absorbed the right way anyway. And we don't even know whether the natural proportion of one vitamin to another, because they, they work in tandem, right? So when I just go back to our natural multivitamin, that's going to have all of the vitamins and minerals in proper proportions to one another, and possibly even chemicals we haven't yet isolated and discovered. I mean, vitamin K2 was only discovered in the last few uh, decades, you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, like those are all in the last century, only did we isolate the chemical structure, right? Absolutely. So there are a lot of things we still haven't isolated and discovered. So I think just going to uh, the source from its whole natural source, like uh, eating organ meats, or if you can't stomach organ meats, like I can't, then just get the desiccated organ supplements. They're just dried up organs. Oh, cool. you've, you've still seen benefit and you've still seen some people like up their nutrition and get their, get their themselves feeling better with just using a desiccated product. Exactly. So. Exactly. I don't, it's hard to know if they're feeling better because we've added the desiccated supplement. It's almost impossible for me to tell you that's what caused it because they're also changed their diet they've started exercising they're eating more meat you know it could be it could be any one of those factors so it's like i can't tell you with for sure you know when this client went from you know because once they start with me they're excited they have those mirror neurons to support you know they're eating meat maybe for the first time you know so, so there's so many changes that maybe things they thought were conditions that were aren't affected by diet all of a sudden they go away you know i have women coming out of menopause oh my gosh this is the funniest thing it's like what three three clients now they come out of menopause. My latest client, only three weeks on a strict carnivore. And she was, by the way, animal-based. It wasn't like she was vegan or plant-based. And she just did strict carnivore. And in three weeks, she got her period again when she hadn't had it. She's been in menopause officially for two years straight. <laughs> what, what age range are we talking? Are these women 50. in this age range? Oh, they're in their 50s. She's 50. She just started working with me. We're so excited. So yeah, carnivore diet should come with a warning. Like it can make babies too. So be careful if you don't want them. <laughs> oh my goodness. We, yeah. we are seeing that too. And some people, it, that's kind of gotten out there where some people will specifically ask us. They're like, I went through it. I don't want to go through it again. Um, is this going to bring my period back? And we're like, wait. <laughs> right. Yeah, it will. And uh, it's funny. I don't think people realize that that's a good thing. I think because yes. I've got a lot of comments when I shared that I was so excited. I shared the success yeah. with, on my Instagram and on my Twitter. And they were like, 
I don't want to, I don't want my period again. I'm glad it's done. It's like, what, you want to age faster? Don't you understand that using your cycle, hitting menopause, you've effectively sped up the aging process. And no, people didn't know that. And because when, once they shared that, they're like, oh, okay, no, that makes sense. You know, sometimes, sometimes we get into our heads so much, we're talking science stuff all the time that we forget that somebody who's not in the scientific field might not make that link, you know? So I think it's important that we share that, no, you don't want menopause. You, wanna, yeah, you want to reverse the aging process. And it's a good thing you're getting your cycle back. It means your hormones are kicking back into gear. You're literally reversing the aging process. How exciting is that, you know? Yes, yes, I agree completely. Um, I think that that's such a, and, and the demographic of the people that are coming to carnivore are kind of in that perimenopause, menopause. Of course, all different ages are doing that. Um, but this is what we see too. We see um, hair like coming back, hair growth coming back. We see, um, uh, we had a gal that was in her seventies that had to start shaving her legs again. Yeah, and had she, what? She had to start shaving her legs again because her bo- her body was beginning. I didn't hear that. I didn't. I didn't. Sure, sure. Shaving her legs. She started. Oh growing. my god, that's <laughs> new. That's a new one. Oh. And they're getting uh, their the colors coming back. We're seeing women that have gone gray reverse the color of their hair too so that's amazing that's right? amazing yeah. yeah yeah I wish that would happen to me that never happened to me I still die I, I actually huh you, you too yeah my uh, I think it's a genetic thing I started my first gray hair I was I remember still doing my bachelor's in Lebanon so I graduated with my bachelor's by 22 so I was like imagine at 21 22 and you see your first gray hair my dad also went um, gray very, very young. So there's this genetic thing. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't. I don't know much about it. Like I didn't do too much research. But uh, I do know that when I was doing uh, some content creation about um, FMT, fecal microbiota transplant, mm-hmm. um, it actually reverses gray hair. And then I think the guy was like 94. They gave him the fecal microbiota transplant. Um, because you, he had a C. difficile infection that's antibiotic resistant, whereby you get diarrhea, you could literally die. And the one most effective treatment for that is a uh, poop transplant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, obviously it cured him from the, uh, we know that it does that, which is why that's the only uh, FDA approved use for FMT at the moment. So it cures him of the uh, C. difficile infection. And at the same time, he started, he reversed his gray hair. And then you also could see, uh, reversal of uh he had patches of hair that he had lost they regrew he's he literally had a full head of hair it's It's crazy no incredible i know and anything that's on that age reversal um therapeutic approach is just like we've got to take a closer look at this so you mentioned um the because that was obviously the the extreme of, um, of microbiome kind of a change um, how does the microbiome change and is carnivore uh, healthy for the gut? How does it affect gut health and how does that play into our addiction, our mental health? You actually see more diversity in your gut microbiome when you do carnivore. And so this is exactly what we want. We want to have a more diverse uh, bacteria living in our gut. And with regards to do we need fiber as food for our gut to, to have, you know, a healthier microbiome? I think this idea of what good bacteria, bacterial strains are and what bad bacterial strains are, I think this is all so, so early to, to know because we've barely scratched this mm-hmm. of this uh, microbiome research. We've barely scratched the surface to understand what are all the bacterial strains that we've got to have, how much of this versus how much of that. Case in point, I reported on this uh, study that was done recently that mm-hmm. showed if you get three groups of people, you want to give them uh, an eight-week antibiotic course, right? They're all to give them antibiotics for eight weeks. But what they did is those three groups of people, in one of them, they took their own stools to do the fecal microbiota transplant. So they took their own stools and they stored them so that they could give them the FMT afterwards. Another group of people, um, they were gonna, they were given probiotic supplements after the antibiotic course. And the third group of people was in, was the control. So they didn't give them anything. In those three groups of people, the ones that fared the worst 
in terms of microbiome balance and health were the ones that were given the probiotic pills. It messed up their gut. It didn't go back to normal for a, around six months later. They still didn't have good, healthy microbiome. It still didn't go back to normal. And the ones that did the best were the, the ones that were given the FMT, their own stools that were, uh, that were sourced before the antibiotic course. Why do you think that was? Why do you, why do you, yeah. that they said that it's probably because when you, the, the pills, the, the probiotic pills, um, usually they're like lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. Those are like cheap filler kind of probiotics and you're most commonly found in most probiotic supplements on the market. And the authors said that it's probably too much of a good thing. It crowds out. They, they, they uh, populate the gut very quickly, those kinds, those bacterial strains. And so you take them and now they crowd out the other bacterial strains. And so now you have an imbalance. You don't have the variety. Exactly. Uh-huh. Um, and that's why it's like you can have too much of a good thing, basically what they said. Right. Because they're all in a war. It's like there's this war inside that, right? That are They're all kind of trying to put their, uh, stake their flag in there. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to do an even distribution. And so what you're saying is that a carnivore diet is actually showing that that will get the microbes evenly distributed and in balance. Cause this is all about balance and not letting one process override the other process. And so then it's so weak and it just can't, it can't do what it's supposed to do. Exactly. So. And you have to understand too, that when they look at and they measure healthy people to look at their microbiome, you know, their measure of healthy, like the vast majority of the American population is not healthy. What is it? Uh, 7% only of Americans are metabolically healthy. So you've got, (laughs) so when you're recruiting people for your studies, right? 93% of the sample that you could choose from is metabolically unhealthy. So the vast majority of subjects also aren't really the healthiest, right? And so we're basing a healthy microbiome on those people. Yes. You've got to remember that. Yeah. Oh, I love it. So back to my supplement question. Sometimes some animal foods uh, that are our, our ultimate vitamin is liver. We know that, right? Mm-hmm. And so if someone is in kind of a healing crisis, they're just beginning, they're coming from that vegan background where they're so de- 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 deficient on nutrients. Depleted, yeah. Yeah. That we can use a, an animal food vitamin to help that. Um, mm-hmm. I just, curious if there are other, like I wanted to ask about MCT, like the popular keto supplements that people are still using. We talked kind of covered on ACV. I'm just kind of thinking through like, what are these common things that yeah. when you go on the keto that you're using? I'd like you to talk to, talk to me about the MCT a little bit and what damage that can do. And yeah. then I'd also like to hear about if there's any other non-animals uh, types of vitamins and supplements that you ever bring in or any other animal type of supplements. I do work a lot with magnesium and vitamin D um, because you have to uh, remember that a lot of people come into carnivore with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so it takes a little while for SIBO to to be healed. And SIBO is the main cause of constipation. So you get on a carnivore diet and you're eating less food, you might be, uh, especially if you're doing dairy, dairy is very constipating as well. So um, sometimes it, it can be very uncomfortable. So we can do a little bit of magnesium citrate for a while until the SIBO heals, and that is when you don't need it anymore. Um, vitamin D is also really important. We're living in very um, unnatural environments where we're not getting exposed to the sunshine the way our ancestors used to for you know 16 hours out of the day or whatever. And so while ideally you do want to get sunshine, um, the second best would be to get a sun lamp. Um, that would stimulate a more natural form of vitamin D production. But short of that, you can also take vitamin D supplements to make sure you're not deficient. Most people are severely deficient. They don't even know it because the traditional lab ranges don't flag something like I think less than 30 or 35. They don't even like flag it as severely deficient. So I go by the functional medicine ranges, not what the traditional mainstream organizations are putting out in numbers. Yeah. It's, they take they take decades to to get to a point where functional medicine doctors are already like they're more progressive they're more reactive to newer research you know that's the future of medicine that's right. so those are like the t- main things um mct oil anything coming from coconuts and coconut oil have phytosterols that block cholesterol function in your body and by blocking cholesterol function remember cholesterol is the raw material that you need to create vitamin d so i don't care how much sun you're getting you're not getting enough cholesterol from your diet you're not optimizing for vitamin d and vitamin d is so crucial it's actually a hormone that affects everything in your body 
So I don't like coconut and coconut based products because they've been shown to suppress LDL because of the suppression of, of cholesterol um, function. And when you suppress LDL, we know we have a 400 times increase in Alzheimer's and dementia risk. I mean, there are so many risks associated with that. They don't get publicized because the pharmaceutical companies, they work so closely together with our medical programs and with our doctors after they graduate. And they kind of like, just like with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, how they're literally in bed with the food industry. We see the same thing, unfortunately, with the American Medical Association and with how um, the whole practice of medicine is so closely re um, uh, in bed with the pharmaceutical companies. And so that really biases the uh, translation of the an interpretation of the scientific literature. And so this is why a lot of doctors don't even know about that. I know personally a lot of close medical doctors to me um, who will use margarine instead of butter thinking, you know, that it's, and it, it's, they truly believe that, you know, because of like decade after decade of being um, exposed to that one message and, uh, and only a, a, a fun exercise I do when, I, when I'm around them, they'll have like the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It is so horrifying to go through it. You flip it page after page, every, every other page is a full spread of some drug, you know? And then and the other page would be like, why, why some, some supplement is bad for you, some natural supplement that cannot be patented is bad for you or whatever. They're constantly trying to beat down on anything alternative or natural because you can't patent those things, right? And so they it's it's easy for them to go after them and if you go after that alternative way of doing things then that means now you're only left with one option and it is the use of a pharmaceutical so it's it's horrifying you know absolutely so you touched on um how the other oils we we're talking about things like that what would you say about olive oil or avocado oil so I've done a YouTube video on avocados, how they have this person, a person, P-E-R-S-I-N, is the anti-nutrient, it's an antifungal actually, that's found in avocados. And uh, people like to say, like especially plant-loving yeah. <laughs> audiences, like to point out that it's found in the shell only. And it is true that it is found in higher amounts in the shell, but... I anticipated that objection. So I did extra research <laughs> and you know, there's very clear evidence of chive links in the description box below of the YouTube video I did on avocados. It's very clear that it's still found in the flesh of the avocado if you still have person there. So yeah, so you have anti-nutrients, you have antifungals, you have all kinds of plant self-defense chemicals in, uh, in avocados and in olives. I mean, you olives, are not a natural food. You can't go out in the wild and pick an olive off an olive tree and eat it. It's toxic, it's got bitter toxic compounds. You actually have to detoxify olives before you can sell them as whole olives, right? And so even whole olives are processed, let alone olive oil where you go through additional processing steps. So, you know, why? why not do necessary. This? Yes, yes, this. yes, yes. Right. I yeah. love it. So I'm asking all these little details and um, I like to think about big rocks. What are the big rock components when you're trying to turn your life around, you know, turn it, turn it good. And, and for you, what are those, if you could, I don't know if you have pillars or if you narrow it down to, you know, five things that are, you know, the most crucial, what would you, what would you identify as those? It's all about dopamine and understanding and leveraging dopamine. And so this is why um, the support meetings, the mirror, activating the mirror neurons. I don't think we talked enough about that, but it's okay. That's a whole other topic, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, this why coaching or joining a group coaching session or being surrounded by people who understand this stuff activates your mirror neurons and you use this primal psychological drive that hasn't been hijacked by addiction. It's one of like the first, the few things in your brain as an addict that you can rely on. It's, okay. it's, it's just source of energy and power that you can leverage. So wow. the support meetings and all that kind of mirror neurons focus on that dopamine regeneration. You need to go after the root cause of the addiction and the root cause of the addiction and the cravings and the withdrawals is a massive reduction in the number of D2 receptors. In other words, a massive reduction in the dopaminergic activity of your brain. And if you don't have enough dopamine in your brain, 
you can only fight this for so long before yep. you're going to relapse, you know? So yes. this is why going after regenerating D2 receptors, I talk a lot about exercise. Remember, I did my dissertation on exercise and how that can influence addiction. So that is one thing, but there are additional things. Because if you have serious joint pain, especially initially, or it's reasons for why it is impossible for you to train, then there are other things that I talk a lot about on my YouTube channel. And then uh, obviously abstinence. If, and I talk a lot from an addiction point of view just because almost 85% of the population has a case of addiction. And so, yeah, if, if for you, if it's not about addiction, we can talk about other pillars, but I'm just talking from what we could Sure, tell. sure. When you right? were seeing like the 30, 30, 30, that 30% 30 of us are pure addicts, 30% of us are harmful users, that puts us yeah. in the 60, and 30% of us are normies. But out of these three categories that we all kind of land in this 85% category of dealing with addiction of some kind. Exactly, 100%, okay. exactly. Okay. Um, because even the people who are moderate uh, users, harmful users, or even normies, um, if they ab abstain and they regenerate due to receptors, they're going to have a much easier time. You know? And if this can be why for some people, carnivore isn't this big emotional journey. It's just like, oh, this just makes sense. I started eating meat and I felt great. Like I'm just going to eat meat. But for those of us that were in that 30, the, the harmful users to the addict, our life is like completely flipped around because our D2s were so out of whack, right? Exactly. Okay. Perfectly said. Exactly. So we talked about the support. We talked about the D2 receptor regeneration. We talked about abstinence. Now, if we're, if you want to get sober, you can't do the drug as a cheat meal, right? And uh, so that's really important. And um, what else that I would say? I would say the mindset and the psychology behind it. I think a lot of people have limiting beliefs and because of that, they don't dream big. And because they don't dream big, they're uninspired to go over the initial hump that you need to go through to gather enough momentum, you know? So I do do a lot of that work, psychology and, and, and uh allowing people and helping them listen to their listen to their gut you know you wouldn't have the urge to do something if you didn't already have the goods to make it happen if mm -hmm. your subconscious didn't already know that you can actually be great at this you wouldn't even be pulled towards it like for example you know that i do raps right i i write oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. why is it that this is the thing that i am drawn to why is it that i am not drawn to become an actress or um, become an astronaut, or um, I mean, there's there's a gazillion and one things in the world that I could be drawn to. Why is it this one thing? It's because my subconscious mind knows that I have the goods to make that particular thing. You know what I mean? Yes, your desires, the things that call out to you is what you have inside. You've got the goods inside to match up with that desire. Exactly, it comes from somewhere. It doesn't just it doesn't just, it's not put in there for no reason. It, you, you're drawn to it because, you remember, your subconscious mind is far more powerful than your conscious mind. It's far more uh, intelligent because um, while my conscious mind right now is just focused on this interview and on Emily and on the audience that is uh, listening to this, how they're going to receive the message, that's just a very small part of my brain. But I'm also in the my vision is also catching the bird that just passed here in the window, the grass, the palm tree that's waving in the wind. I can, I'm aware of far more things, but it's not, it's in my subconscious awareness. I'm not fully focused on that. All the stuff that gets stored in your subconscious brain. Now imagine the gazillion stimuli that you have accumulated from birth till today all this stuff you think that you're not aware of it, but you are, and it all gets stored and stored and stored in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And so this is why intuition is so important. It's mm -hmm. because that feeling you get, this kind of, when you think about it, almost takes your breath away. That's mm -hmm. a very strong emotion. That's your intuition. That the only way that your vast knowledge base can make you pay attention to it is via emotion. It's a fast way for your, for your conscious mind to understand something as opposed to going through all the reasons why you should do this. <laughs> it's like, let's start from when you were one year old and you watched this performance and you really enjoyed it. And let's, you know, like instead of going through every single experience, every single little element that your subconscious mind picked up over decades of your life, 
a fast way to get you to understand a message is to raise is to send that emotion and that's that mm-hmm. your intuition telling you this is what you should be doing so you got to trust that I hear you talking about listening to intuition and listening to those sparks inside of you and asking those questions of the things that do spark you. And that that's actually a component, which it sounds like a lot of creativity. This is, I meet a lot of creatives and that Dr. Kilt's come to mind with his pottery. And so finding, and you're in there wrapping. So finding these things that sort of uncover um, these desires, I think is really important too, and will feed a system that is uh, getting addicted to the good stuff right? Yes. So trying to switch that and have that be that our desires are going, moving forward. We've got this clear mind, we've got the inflammation down, and then we can focus on those desires that are uh, bringing us forward. Um, I do want to wrap up with a question for you. So uh, speaking of things that pull us forward, I, this is, I'm brand new baby new at um, YouTube and uh, starting this podcast and kind of going about this journey. And I just uh, would love some advice tips. Like if you think that this is a good thing to be doing, you've been doing this for what, a couple of years now, three years, three years. Oh my gosh. This is my yeah. first month. And so what do you have to say to those of us that are thinking this is going to be part of our creative process is reaching an audience through, through this platform. I'm so excited that you're doing this. I'm always recommending this to everybody. For me, I really um, was stretching every last dollar to make it so that I wouldn't get employed. Like, I I know it's about to start happening, start making good income from that. And I just, you got to... You got to trust the process because I started with zero, you know, zero connection, zero everything. I think we all do for the most part. Um, And so what my advice to you is you have to understand that it's a long road, especially in the beginning, but then it's, it's not a linear trajectory. It's not like you're constantly getting better and better. It's like nothing happens and then it explodes. It's, It's an exponential curve. Yes. So, um, because a lot of people are going to give up in the first few months, it's like you post a video and it gets 10 views. My first few videos were like 20 views, 45 <laughs> views, you know, if you can actually go to my YouTube channel and, and I think there is a way to, to live, to sort it. I don't know. I think they oh, by most viewed or something. Yeah. Mo- yeah. Or like by date, they, there used to be a way to sort it by date. Uh, I don't know if they, you, you still have that option to do that, but you can see my earliest videos. And uh, you can see how how barely it got any views. Now, of course, they get even more views now because if people are watching my newer videos, YouTube is probably also suggesting all my videos to them, even if they're old. So whatever, like if you don't see something that has uh, 45 views, just know at some point it did. <laughs> Maybe now it's got 400 or 500, but it probably was at 45 views. So yeah, just be patient. Um, I love what I do. I would rather honestly be skinned alive than go get employed. <laughs> That's how strongly I believe about being my own boss and setting my own schedule and choosing the topics and the projects and the things that are that I'm passionate about today because I might be passionate about something else in a couple of months you know that's right like right now like my recent passion is if you noticed uh we're still talking carnivore of course is great but um a lot more food addiction sugar addiction because I think I feel like that's the future because everybody knows especially if it's our audience that yeah carnivore is fantastic they just can't do it. So I realized that that's where most people need the most support to be able to comply and adhere to the diet. So um, that, and yeah, you, you know, there is no cap, there's no upper limit to what you can achieve. You can literally become a billionaire just by growing your brand. And you don't have to, I think, yeah, the biggest thing, especially as women, right, the, the world tries to put you in a box is like, you're a professor. You can't also do photo shoots or you are, I mean, you, you've probably gotten that. I think as women, we, we get this all the time. People try to control us and put us in a label more so than they do to men and try to restrict what we can and cannot do. So never, never let the world box you in. You know better than anybody what you can and cannot do, what you're capable of. And as long as you listen to that intuition and to that gut instinct and literally not care about what any external input is, you will always do the right thing. You, you can never go wrong by listening to your intuition and an educated intuition, not just saying sitting on a couch all day long and listen to your, no, it's like you constantly want to expose yourself to 
new activities, new skills, new podcasts, interviews, ideas, because the more you educate your intuition, the stronger and more accurate it gets. So listening to that, not let anybody box you in. Um, remember, when you are creating something, you are leading your audience. You're not following your audience. There's a reason why I follow somebody. Like, you know, if I'm following an account, it's because I, I want to be led by that account in that specific area, right? And so if you are leading, you're, you're not pandering or, or, or just doing what everybody tells you they want to hear from you. It's like, no, this is what I'm doing. You're welcome to join yeah, or, or not. Maybe, maybe, this, I, maybe my thing is not for you, you know? And so you, eventually, as long as you stick with what you think is right, you will continuously attract people who are your people, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how you create the world that you want to create. Dr. Zavadar, you're a fierce lioness. <laughs> I am so thankful to have you in my corner and to be in the same tribe that we are and um, understanding these truths and you take it to a depth and bring this intuition level to a, a position that is so motivating and so inspiring. Uh, where can we find you? What's happening next? What things are you excited about in your life right now? Mm easy to find me dr sarah zaldivar.com give me maybe a couple of days I, I my website was hacked and so now they need me to email them a copy of my id <laughs> the hacking saga never ends <laughs> so it's just because i think that i had like the, an identity theft situation and like every few months i one of its consequences shows up somewhere you know and i have to fix it so anyway dr sarah zaldivar.com forward slash shop is where you see all of my coaching packages but also you can go to my instagram and you can see it's pinned on um, my coaching packages. Um, so my Instagram is at dr.sarah.zaldivar. And you can see my name right here, right? So it's very easy. And the uh, YouTube channel, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, very easy to find me. Um, I do have the TikTok, the Twitter, the LinkedIn, the Pinterest. Um, they're not as frequently updated as my YouTube and Instagram. I think those are the areas where I'm most active. And yeah, the coaching packages, I do one-on-one -on -one and I also do group coaching. The group coaching I'm very excited about. So uh, getting more and more people uh, joining us and I'm doing those uh, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So I have meetings held every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern and every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, just like this, you know, people join, they, uh, they can either turn their camera on or off depending if they're, uh, they're feeling chatty on that day or not. And, you know, they can either just listen or just ask me their questions and I give you personalized, you know, advice on, you know, what, what in your specific case might help you, whereby it might not help somebody else, depending on their, you know, so many different variables. So we do that, it's like coaching and at the same time, group support, just sharing what you're going through, you know? So it's very helpful, activate again, those mirror neurons that are so important. So yeah, that's, pretty much where you can find me. Um, what I'm most excited about, I'm always excited about something. Um, right now, very excited about sharing the knowledge on food addiction and sugar addiction. And I, I don't think people are even close to being as uh, aware as they should be as to how addictive those foods are. Um, so doing a lot of work in that. And of course, the rap where I'm always writing songs and recording and yeah, just trying to, you know, improve and get better and better with every new song that I write. So yeah, those are those, that's pretty much it. Wow. Well, it has been such a pleasure. I hope to have many more conversations with you. I feel like your brain is an encyclopedia. And so as long as we have time to keep the conversation going, I'm very hopeful. You are an inspiring friend, mentor, professional. Um, I just look up to you on every level. And I thank you so much for this time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Emily.